Our sermon text this morning is taken from Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 to 11. These are the words of God. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a, with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, and th that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. It's the second message in a series during Advent that I've entitled, The End of the World is Just the Beginning. The End of the World is Just the Beginning. Last week we looked at a, a portion of Matthew chapter 24, where Jesus has been asked about uh, the destruction of the temple, the destruction of Jerusalem. And there he, he breaks into a, des a description of the sun going dark and the moon going dark and, and stars falling out of the sky. And it's one of those texts where it would be easy to read it if you don't know the whole story of Scripture to think, well, that sounds like the very end of the world. Now, of course, what Jesus is doing is actually echoing language from the Old Testament prophets where it was common for them to describe the end of an empire the end of a civilization as their sun, moon, and stars going dark. Sort of like when it went black, when it went dark in the, in the plagues of Egypt. God was giving a preview to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians saying, I'm about to put your lights out. I'm about to end your world. And so we looked at Matthew 24 as Jesus describing the end of the old covenant world and the beginning of a new heavens and a new earth. We're continuing that theme by looking today at Revelation chapter 12 and the end of a world in which Satan had quite a bit more power and influence and sway over the nations of men. Now, Revelation, of course, is a notoriously challenging book of the Bible. But like the rest of Scripture, it was written for our edification. Much of it is written in highly symbolic language, but it was written to reveal. That's, that's what revelation means. It was written to reveal the truth, not confuse or obscure it. So when we come to the book of Revelation, whatever your background, whatever your, your history, we want to come to it in faith, believing that like the rest of Scripture, God has for us edification, he has for us the truth, and it wasn't written to confuse us, it was actually written to reveal. One of the interpretive keys for understanding what God is doing and revealing in the book of Revelation actually comes at the very beginning. When the, when the book first opens and John is, is, is introducing the book, um, he gives us a, a really important interpretive key. It says, this is the first couple of verses, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who, by record of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus and all the things that he saw, blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep these things which are written therein for the time is at hand. The book opens with John saying, what I was shown, what was revealed unto me, is something that is going to take place very soon. Blessed are you who are reading this and hearing this. This is about to happen to you. 
And so uh, we should take that as our default in understanding what the book of Revelation is about. What John saw in the Revelation was an apocalyptic vision of things that had happened or were about to happen in the first century. Very, very shortly. That should be our default unless there's something there that uh, has to be taken in some other way. Our default in coming to the book of Revelation should be, all right, John's talking to, there were seven churches in particular that he's going to give particular messages to with people who were living in that day uh, in the first century. And John's saying to them, this is about to happen to you. And so our default when coming to the book of Revelation is it's talking about things that were happening in the first century. We noted the same thing last week, that when Jesus described what sounded like the end of the world was actually the end of the old covenant world and the inauguration of a new heavens and a new earth upon his ascension. And again, in Matthew 24, Jesus said, this, all these things are going to take place during this generation. All these things are going to take place during this generation. Likewise, we see here in Revelation 12, another angle on the same events. We're, we're, what, what we're seeing here is another angle, a heavenly angle of the same basic uh, time period and the same end of one era and the beginning of a new, only it's from a heavenly perspective. It's from a heavenly angle rather than uh, the one uh, the sort of using the prophetic language that Jesus did in Matthew 24. Here we, we see described the defeat of Satan and his kingdom by the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. Again, what we're, what, what's being described here in Revelation 12 is the end of a world. The end of a world where Satan had far more power, far more authority, far more influence. And what's described here in Revelation 12 is the end of that world and the beginning of a new one. The beginning of a new one where Christ reigns. So I want to walk through this text Verse by verse, Revelation 12, John actually sees two signs or two wonders in heaven. The first one is a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. Last week, we looked at the symbolism of sun, moon, and stars in scripture and noted, recall that in Genesis chapter 1, when the sun, moon, and stars are created, one of the explicit reasons given for their creation, God says right at the beginning is that only are, not only are they given for light, they are, they're given for lights, they're also given for signs, it says. In Genesis chapter 1, when they're first made, they're given for signs. God says not only am I giving the sun, moon, and stars to give you light, to rule the light, and the, the daytime and the nighttime, and so forth, to give you light, and so on, but you know what? I'm actually also giving them to you because I want to speak to you through them. They're going to be signs and symbols for you. I, I noted that... Um, Remember when Joseph had his dream, Joseph in Genesis had his dream that uh, the sun, moon, and 11 stars are bowing down to him, and he, get up, he gets up the next morning and says, guys, I had this crazy dream, and, you know, and he tells them, the sun, moon, and 11 stars are bowing down to me. It, nobody scratched their head at the breakfast table and was like, huh, I wonder what that means. Everybody at the breakfast table knew what it meant. They were mad, right? I mean, they, they didn't say, oh, let's think about that. I wonder what's going on here. No, that's not what they said at all. They were mad. You're saying mom and dad and, and your 11 older brothers are going to bow down to you? You're crazy. You're insane. Of course, that's what ends up happening, right? But they knew right away because they knew that sun, moon, and stars represent rulers. And in this case, Abraham's family, Jacob's family, uh, this is this is the, the nation of Israel, the beginning of, of the promises being fulfilled to, to Abraham to make him a great nation. The, the powers of that nation, the rulers of that nation, the sun, moon, and stars of that nation are Jacob and his wife and his children. It's, it's, the, it's the family of Jacob, the family of Israel. Like Joseph's dream, this woman in Revelation chapter 12 represents Israel. It's the sun and moon and 12 stars, the 12 tribes. The sun, moon, and stars, and 12 stars. This woman represents Israel, I would argue, from Eve to Mary and everything in between. Sort of think of it like a composite picture, a composite representative image. It's a woman, but the woman represents Israel, and think of it particularly with the faces from Eve to Mary. 
the, the, the whole gamut of the old covenant, Israel. And she's, of course, travailing in birth. She's great with child. She's, about, she's going into labor. And she's being threatened by the second wonder, the second sign, a dragon, a great red dragon, standing before the woman, waiting to devour her child. You see this in verses 3 and 4. Of course, this reminds us of Herod and the slaughter of the innocents. Herod, sort of an earthly um, representative of the dragon and what he's seeking to do to kill the child, and the fact that he sent his soldiers out and they slaughtered uh, the innocent children. The child that is born is Jesus, because he is described as the man who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron. So in verse 5 it says, She brought forth a man-child who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. That description, ruling all the nations with a rod of iron, is, a, is an echo of Psalm 2. And in Psalm 2 there's a prophecy of the Messiah who will, will reign over and rule over all the nations with a rod of iron. And then it says, He is caught up to heaven to God. That's verse 5. And so what we have here is a, in one verse a description of the whole incarnation, a birth, and then it, it sort of just skips over but subsumes birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension, all together, all together. That whole thing um, is described there in verse 5. While the woman, we're told, flees into the desert where God prepares a place for her, Israel is scattered in the wake of all this. Think of Stephen being stoned and then the people in, in Jerusalem having to scatter because of the persecution of people like Saul and others. They're scattered to, to, the, to the desert, to the wilderness, where a place is prepared for her. And, but a war then breaks out in heaven. And Michael and his angels fight and defeat and cast out the great red dragon, who is that old serpent from the Garden of Eden, the devil and Satan. So just in case you're, we were unsure, okay, there's a dragon, who's the dragon? The text tells us explicitly who the dragon is. The dragon is that old, um, that old devil, the, that old dragon from the beginning, the devil, Satan. And there's a war in heaven between Michael and his angels and the dragon and his angels. And the, and the, and the angels of God, Michael and his angels, fight and defeat, and they cast out the great red dragon. He's cast out of heaven to earth. Again, we see that in verses 6 to 9. When this happens, John hears a loud voice announcing that salvation and the kingdom of God and of his Christ has come. There's, there's the new world. Satan has been cast out. Salvation has come. A ki the kingdom of God and of his Christ has come because the accuser has been cast down to earth. He's been cast down to earth where he is overcome by the saints, by the blood of the Lamb, and by their testimony. We see that in verses 10 and 11. So let's look at a couple of themes in this text. There's quite a bit here, and we don't have the time to look at every detail. But this text, together with several others, uh, teaches us that before Christ came, before Christ came, Satan, which means accuser, remember, Satan means accuser, before Christ came, Satan enjoyed far greater power, and in particular, had that power through access to heaven to accuse the brethren before God night and day. That's what it says in verse 10. There's this celebration. Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. Why? For the accuser, that's Satan, of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Satan has been cast down. Salvation has come. Satan has been cast down. Everything is made new. And, and, and we see this, actually, and you say, accusing them night and day, what, what's that about? Well, we actually have a glimpse of this back in the book of Job. Remember, remember the book of Job? Where you, you, it opens in this really idyllic scene. Job is this righteous man. He's, he's, he's faithful. He's upright. God's blessed him greatly. He has these children. He has these flocks. He has a great kingdom. He prays for them. He offers sacrifices for them. And then you, and then you have this, this verse that says, And then there was a day when the sons of God gathered before God in heaven, and Satan came in among them. And when you're reading Job, and you read those verses, you should say, Hey, what? <laughs> Satan just, just sauntered on in like he lives there? This is heaven, the good place. 
heaven where God is, heaven where the good angels are, and Satan just, just, who let him in, right? Who, who let him in there? Well, there he is, he's there, and God says, oh, hi, hi Satan, how are you doing? He's like, you're being a little friendly, God. He says, what you been doing? Well, I've been going to and fro along the earth. Oh, and then God says those words that no one ever wants to hear said about them. Have you considered my servant Job? <laughs> we, all, we all sort of wish to be the, like we want to be in the crowd, but we don't want to be noticed too much. Like, you know, we want to be in heaven. We want to be there like part of God's people, but we, we don't want him to notice, you know, know our name that well. <laughs> hey, have you considered my favorite guy, Job? He's, he's fantastic. Now, of course, what does, Job, what, is, what does Satan do? Well, Satan begins to accuse him. Because right on schedule, that's what Satan does. And what is he, he says, you know, God says, have you considered my servant Job? He's righteous, he's upright, he's faithful. And Satan says, yeah, that's just because you've put a hedge of protection around him. You've blessed him so well that, of course, yeah, he's pious. Of course, he gives thanks to you. Of course, he's faithful to you. Because you've blessed him so well, everything's going so well for him. I know if you remove that hedge of protection, then he'll curse you. And God says, bet, basically, right? It's in the Hebrew. The, um, the word there, though, I interestingly, in, in Job, every time you see the word Satan, it's not usually um, uh, translated in our English translations, but in, in Hebrew, it actually adds the definite article to Satan all through the book of Job. Every time you see the word Satan, it's actually the Satan. The Satan. And, and, that, and that's on purpose because what's being underlined is his job, underline what he does. He accuses. You could just as easily translate it, the accuser. The accuser is there, and the accuser does what he does best. He accuses. He says, yeah, he's faithful and righteous before you, but that's only because you've been so nice to him, God. Let me tear his life apart, then he'll curse you. That won't work very long. But what Revelation 12 says is that at the ascension of Jesus... The power of the accuser was destroyed, and he was cast down out of heaven. He was cast down out of heaven. How did this happen? How did this happen? Well, the power of Satan, the dragon, is the power of death. The power of Satan, the dragon, is the power of death. It says this in Hebrews chapter 2. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood... He also himself likewise took part of the same. That's talking about Jesus becoming flesh and blood, the incarnation. In, in the same way that we're flesh and blood, God became flesh and blood in Jesus Christ. Why? Hebrews 2 continues. That through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Who had the power of death? The devil. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So God became flesh, Jesus was born of Mary, in order that he might have flesh and blood so that he might die in order to destroy the power of death and destroy him who had the power of the death, the devil, and deliver everyone who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So we need to ask another question. Why do sinners fear death and why are they in bondage to death? Why do sinners fear death and why are they in bondage to death? Well, the answer is because the wages of sin is death. Romans 8, 23. The wages of sin is death. Guilty sinners know that they deserve death. Guilty sinners know that they deserve death, and so they fear it. They know the devil's got dirt on them. They know that if, if their internet search history was studied carefully, it wouldn't come out good for them. They know that they've lied. They know that they've cheated. They know that they lost their temper. They know they thought things and said things and did things that are completely inexcusable. Guilty sinners know they deserve death. But Christ came to deliver guilty sinners. Christ came to deliver guilty sinners. And he did this by paying for their sin and forgiving them so that they no longer fear death and Satan has no power over them. Do you follow? Do you follow this? If the power of the devil is death, and he holds sinners in prison because they're guilty, and they know they deserve it, he's the accuser, he brings the charges, and the charges are like chains. 
The charges are like chains and they wrap around them because they know they're guilty. Yeah, you're right. I did, I did lie. I lied. I cheated. I stole. I, I did these things. And the charge comes and the chain goes on. And they're held in bondage because they know. I know I deserve death. I deserve bad things. I don't deserve blessing. That's how the power of the devil works. That's how the power of death works. But this is why Christ came. So Colossians 2, Colossians 2 verse 13 says this, and you being dead in your sins and trespasses, you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, made you alive together with Jesus, having forgiven you all your trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. What did Jesus do? Jesus took the things that are, are what the devil uses as accusations. You're not a good mom. You're not a good dad. You're not a good husband. You're not a good wife. You're not a good son. You're not a good daughter. You're not a good spouse. You're not a good child. You're, you're not a good worker. You're not all these things. And, he, and the devil brings these things and he heaps them up in accusations. This is what you've done. This is why you're not good. This is not why you're very good. Right? That's the accusation. Those are the chains. And Jesus took the chains and they were nailed to his cross. The handwriting that was against us, all the accusations that could be brought against us, all, all of that, all the charges were nailed to his cross. And they were nailed to his cross, all the, all the sins, all the handwriting of ordinances, everything that was against us, everything the devil could bring was nailed to the cross, right? And took it out of the way. And what did he do by doing that? It says he spoiled the principalities and powers and made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Now, the old King James uses the word spoil there, and unless you, you're, you're up on your archaic English, you might think spoiled. Is that like, you know, when you leave something in the fridge for a long time? No, not like that kind of spoiled. Spoiled here means plundered. Spoil here means to plunder. Spoil means to overtake and take back what doesn't belong to them, okay? That, that's what's being done here. When Jesus nailed all the charges against us to his cross, what did he do? It says he went and plundered the principalities and powers, the satanic powers. He went and plundered them. What did he plunder from them? You and me. That's what he plundered from them. Sinners, guilty sinners that were held in their prison cells, in the devil's prison cell, in the Satan's prison, where they were in bondage. When their sins were paid for, the prison cells broke open. The chains fell off. You were unbound because all the charges have been paid for. Right? The power that he has is what? Charges. But what if the charges have been paid for? What if it's no, he pulls it up, you lied. And you say, yeah. And Jesus bled and died for my lies. You lusted. And Jesus bled and died for my lust. You stole. And Jesus bled and died for that theft. You, you got angry. You blew up. You yelled. You cursed. Yes. And Jesus bled and died for it all. That's the, if, if, if that's the case, then Satan doesn't have any power over you. That's the, the power he has is you're guilty. And, and the answer is the blood of the lamb. The answer is the blood of the lamb. Yes, I was guilty. And he bled and he died. And now I'm free. In the very beginning of the book of Revelation, when, when, when John sees Jesus and all his, his glory He's, he's just, he's this, you know, glorious man clothed in all this, 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 these garments and this bright light and all the rest of it. And then Jesus says this to John. This is in chapter 2, verse 18. He says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and death. That's not just Jesus, you know, you read that and be like, well, that's nice. He's got keys. No, no, no. He, he's got the keys of hell and death. What did he do? He went, he went and died. He took the penalty. And what did he do? He broke open the prison of the devil. He got the keys. And now nothing can get locked in there apart from him. And he's the one who has the keys of death and hell. He's the one who releases. He's the one who breaks them out. Your sins are paid for. Go free. Your sins are paid for. Go out. 
He has no power here. The devil says he lied. No, he's forgiven. He's still, no, he's forgiven. He lost his temper. He's forgiven. You have no power here because of the blood of the lamb. That's, that's how the power of Satan has been broken. What can he bring against you? What charge can be brought against God's elect? Paul asks in Romans. It is God who justifies. By the blood of the lamb, the sins are paid for. You have no power here. Try someone else, Satan. Go somewhere else. My sins are paid for. Now, the thing that really can't be underestimated is that this is a massive cosmic change in the world. This, this new reality, this new reality has changed the world. We live in a new world where this is now the case. A new world where Satan is no longer in heaven accusing the brethren night and day. A new world where Jesus is on the throne, where the blood of the lamb is on the throne. In fact, Jesus describes this as the judgment of this world. You say, well, that's, that's really neat. That's, that's kind of neat. No, 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 no. <laughs> this is the judgment of the world, Jesus said. This is in John chapter 12. Jesus said this, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to me. This he said, signifying what death he would die. What happened? What happened during the ministry of Jesus and his death and resurrection? Satan was dethroned. Satan was cast down. He was kicked off whatever throne he had. He's described here by Jesus as the prince of this world. Well, whatever that was, he's kicked off it. He's cast down. He has been judged because Jesus died on the cross. Or, or in Mark chapter 3, again, you have a similar picture of Jesus doing battle with Satan. He's accused of having a devil. Jesus, they said he's got a demon, he's got Beelzebub. And Jesus says, well, if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, well, he can't stand. His kingdom's going to fall. He has an end. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. Again, spoiling means plundering. Jesus says, yeah, I don't have a devil, but yeah, you're right. The end of Satan's rule, yeah, it's come. In fact, um, I'm first going to bind him, and then I'm going to plunder his house. I'm going to chain him up, and then I'm going to take back all that is mine. And this is exactly what Jesus came to do, and he did, beginning with sending out the 70 evangelists during his earthly ministry. Remember, during his ministry, he sent out 70, and in Luke 10, it says, and the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject to us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan like lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. That's Luke 10, 17 to 19. The 70 come back and say, Lord, even the demons are obeying us. We're casting out demons, and we're having pretty good success. And Jesus says, yeah, I know. Satan has fallen from heaven. You're, you have authority. You're having success because Satan's power is waning. Satan's being destroyed. Satan has fallen from heaven. In Daniel chapter 10, there's this kind of a strange uh, interchange, exchange between uh, an angel and Daniel. And, and the angel describes angelic beings over various nations. In fact, the angel says, sorry, I'm running late. <laughs> Uh, I would have been here sooner, except for the prince of Persia held me up. And if you're reading along in Daniel, you should say, wait, what? You're an angel. How'd the prince of Persia hold you up? Well, apparently there was some kind of angelic struggle going on. And he says, I was in, I was in war with the prince of Persia and the prince of Greece. And then he refers to Michael, who's the angel in Revelation 12, leading the armies against uh, the dragon and his angels, and he says, uh, only your, your prince, Michael, one of the chief princes, was with me to fight against them. It's in Daniel 10, verses 13 to 21. The, this suggests that in the old covenant world, angels and demons played a far more significant role in international politics. The angel shows up and starts talking to Daniel and says, actually, I was in conflict with the prince of Persia and the prince of Greece, 
I take, I take that to mean not the, the material, physical uh, leaders of Greece and Persia, since that would seem strange that an angel would be held up by them, but rather angelic beings, demons, over these pagan empires that were in some kind of great conflict with this angel and Michael, the prince of Israel. So this suggests that in the Old Covenant world, angels and demons played a far more significant role in international politics, the demons in particular, under the authority and power of Satan, those stars and angels cast down along with him. But with the coming of Jesus, the principalities and powers have been spoiled. With the coming of Jesus, the stars have been cast down. With the coming of Jesus, the dragon and his angels have fallen like lightning. They've been plundered. Because Christ is on his throne, those who reign with him now even reign over angels. So in 1 Corinthians 6.3, it says, Why are you taking each other to court? Don't you know that even the saints will judge the angels? Don't you know that now in Christ you're seated in heavenly places, even over principalities and powers? Now whether the war in heaven, here in Revelation 12, whether that war in heaven that John saw is symbolic of the earthly ministry of Jesus, which would be one way to take it. One way to take this text would be to say, what John saw was the heavenly version of the ministry of Jesus. That when the 70 went out, Satan fell. When Jesus was lifted up, Satan was destroyed. Satan's power and kingdom were thrown down. One way to read this would be that John saw from a heavenly perspective what happened in the earthly ministry of Jesus. Or it would also be just as fine, I think, to take this as a, an actual heavenly parallel of the same events. While these things were going on on earth, this was also going on in heaven. While the evangelists were going out, the angels were fighting. Some of them were being cast down. When Jesus was lifted up, Satan is cast down. As Jesus ascends, Satan lands um, on, on the earth. Uh, th either way, either way, the point is the same. Satan has been cast down, significantly bound and chained. His power of accusation has been greatly diminished because of the blood of the Lamb. Captivity is taken captive. Jesus has taken captivity the prison cell of accusation, the prison cell of condemnation, Jesus took it, and now he has the keys to it. Now death and hell serve him. He's Lord. Satan has been cast down. The world has been made new. There was an old world where Satan had great power. There was an old world where demons ran things. There was an old world where those satanic powers had great authority and power through the power of accusation, through the fear of death through a condemnation, through our guilt. Jesus died, breaking that whole kingdom open, and he ascended to heaven with his bloody hands to prove it. And he set captives free. So what does this mean for us? Number one is just the big picture. That old world has died. The end of that world it marks the beginning of a brand new one that's been going for 2,000 years. Since Jesus ascended into heaven, the devil has no more access to heaven. He doesn't get to go up there now and accuse us night and day. He doesn't have the kind of power he used to have because of the blood of the lamb. Satan has been cast down to earth where he can still make some havoc. We, we don't deny that Satan still exists and he can still do a bit. He can and does prowl about like a lion, it says in 1 Peter 5 seeking whom he may devour. But notice what Revelation 12 says. He's cast down, and what happens? What happens because he's cast down? It says, For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. He's cast down, why? How? So that we can get at him. He's cast down so that we can overthrow him. He's cast down so that we can overcome him. He does prowl about like a lion, but because of Christ, he's a wounded and shackled lion, and his lies and accusations can be overcome by the blood of the lamb. In one of the epistles, Paul says, resist the devil, and what? And he will flee from you. It's really striking. It doesn't say resist the devil and good luck. <laughs> Hope you make it. 
That's not what it says. It says resist the devil, what? And he will run away. How do Christians resist? By the blood of the lamb, right? By the blood of the lamb. He comes bringing accusation. What does he accuse you of? And the blood of the lamb says, it was paid for. It is finished. Your accusation is meaningless here. It's, you know, it's like if you occasionally I've gotten a parking ticket, I admit it. It would be like somebody, you know, I, sometimes I would you keep some and just, I don't know, you remember that you paid it or whatever. And, and then you know, what if, you know, the, somebody said, you have parking tickets, you, you, you owe. You say, no, it's paid. You, you have no business here. It's paid for. Right? The, the devil comes. He brings up stuff from your past. He, think, he brings up stuff you've thought, stuff you've said, stuff you've done. Right? The blood of the lamb resists and overcomes it and scares the devil away because you say, it's paid for. My sin was nailed to the cross. It was paid for. You have nothing here. You have nothing on me. Go bother someone else. The saints overcome the accuser by the blood of the lamb and their testimony. And they do this particularly through confession of sin and forgiveness. And I want to I close here by just drilling down on this. In 1 John it says that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ his, his son cleanses us from all unrighteousness. This is how we walk in the light. The way we walk in the light is by confessing sins. A couple of verses later, it says, well, you say, the blood of, of Christ cleanses me. How does it cleanse me? It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How do you fight the devil? How do you fight the devil? By confessing your sins and forgiving one another promptly. That's how. You apply the blood of Jesus. How is the blood of Jesus applied? Well, confess. Confess your sins. There's, there's actually only a few places in the New Testament if you have time sometime, do, just do a quick word search of Satan and the devil. There's only a few places in the New Testament where a specific warning is given to Christians, watch out for the devil here. There's only a handful. It'd be worth checking them out. <laughs> where, where does the devil attack? One of them is in Ephesians 4. It says this, let not the sun go down on your wrath, neither give place to the devil. It's one of the few places in the New Testament that says, watch out for the devil here. You want to make sure your doors are locked and your windows are locked at night from the devil? Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't let the sun go down on your bitterness. Don't let the sun go down on your resentment. Don't be angry. Don't have grievances. Be in fellowship. The devil loves to get into homes where sin goes unconfessed and then resentment grows overnight like mold. You overcome Satan by the blood of the lamb and you do that by applying the blood of the lamb through confession of sin and forgiving one another as quickly as you possibly can. You know the rule about, you know, if you spill something and you get a stain on your shirt, what do you do? Put water on that right away. <laughs> Spray, put some Tide on that. Do something quick, right? The longer you let it sit, the harder it is to get out. Okay. Now the blood of the lamb is that detergent. The blood of the lamb is what washes all the sins clean. You overcome Satan by the blood of the lamb by confessing and forgiving one another quickly. And, and you need to remember, this means all the time. The, the devil likes to come at us at just the most inopportune times. Right? The devil likes to attack you right at the moment where you think, well, that would be really, really inconvenient. Or I'm just not, we just can't, we can't do it. So, you know, one of the classic times would be late at night. You're tired. Everyone's tired. You're fatigued. You're, you're, you know, you're all done. And then something gets discombobulated. You, you said, what? What? I didn't, I didn't mean that. Well, that's what you said. No, it's not. Right? And it's out. And you're, and you're bleary-eyed. And it's, you know, for me, that's like after 8 p.m., right? <laughs> like anytime after 8 p.m., that's when the devil comes out, right? Go to bed. Um, the, the, but you, you, what do you do? Because the, the temptation is you're like you can keep fighting and arguing, it's just getting worse. Or you, can, or you, think, you, you think, well, we have to solve this. Well, know the difference between fellowship and everything being figured out. Sometimes right at you know, that time, it's like something comes up and you start having this deep conversation about something, and you really shouldn't have had that deep conversation at, that late at night. So let, let's, let's make a plan to talk about this tomorrow. But please forgive me for losing my temper. Please forgive me for being offended. Please forgive me for getting angry. Please forgive me. I forgive you. Okay, let's plan on talking about this tomorrow at lunch. All right, sounds good. Amen. 
and you can go to bed. You've killed, you've, you've locked the door. The devil can't come in. Fellowship is restored. The blood of Jesus has been applied to the door. The devil can't get in. Now, you might still have something to discuss. You might still have something that you need to work through. Fine, that's fine. You can do that. But don't let the sun go down on the sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Or maybe it's right before church. You know, you're driving to church. You're going to church. And you're feeling, you know, holy and Christian. You got up and all the kids have clothes on. And, and you're driving to church and on your way to church, of course, right? Something happens. Someone says something. Right? Everybody lost it. And you pull up to church and there's everybody and you're smiling and you're waving and hi, yeah, we're here at church. Yeah. And inside, there's, what's going on in there? Right? There's a fire in there. There's mold in there. What are you going to do? Don't go into church like that. Don't. We said, well, there's people waving at us and they're smiling and they, they want to say hi to us and it's church. Wait in your car. Look back. Say, kids, please forgive me. Dad snapped. Dad lost his temper. Or mom, turn around. Mom, I, it was, please forgive me. I, I snapped at your dad. I snapped at you. I said unkind words. Please forgive me. Right? Don't take the devil into church with you. Right? Kill him there. Resist him. Show him the blood of Jesus. Confess your sin. Forgive one another. And go into church and worship him. Say, let's go into church. Let's worship God. He's so good. He forgives all our sins. He guards us and protects us by the blood of the Lamb. Right? Why are we here, Mom and Dad? Because of the blood of the Lamb. Because he makes us clean. Because he's delivered us from the power of Satan. Because Satan has no power here. Because our sins are forgiven. You see that? That's how you fight. That's how you overcome. That's how you resist. And of course, you know, it happens at all kinds of inopportune times. You know, it's right, right before you've invited people over and you're bustling around getting the house all together. You know, and all of a sudden, you, I don't know. Why are you doing that? And then, ding dong. <laughs> right? What do you do? Don't, don't pretend. Don't lie. Either quickly look over and make it right. Please forgive me. I'm sorry. I lost. I was wrong. I shouldn't have said that. You're forgiven. And then go welcome them in. Welcome your guests in. Don't welcome the devil in. Or let them in because it's cold out there, you know. And have them sit on the couch and give them a cup of hot chocolate and say, we'll be right with you. Okay? You're like, but that's awkward. Yeah, but you know what? It's even more awkward to pretend everything's fine. Right? That's devilish. It's satanic. So don't let the devil in. Say, we'll be right with you. Go into the back room. Say, honey, please forgive me. I shouldn't have said it like that. That was wrong. I forgive you. And then go out and share real fellowship covered in the blood of the lamb. Father, thank you for sending Jesus to destroy the works of the devil. Thank you for the death of Jesus that disarmed the accuser so that we may no longer fear him or death at all. Father, teach us to walk in this light and this joy throughout this season and all our lives through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, singing. Sometimes Christians have gotten the wrong impression that it is somehow holier to have less to do with material things. Of course, there's a massive ditch of gluttony and idolatry and materialism out there looking to created things for what only God can give, elevating created things to a place of honor or meaning on which your joy and your peace depends. But God created this world material. He created it physical, and he filled it with good things. And when God saw all that he had made, he said, it is very good. Sin is what twists our enjoyment of these good gifts. But this world is still a profoundly good place. And when we enjoy the gifts of God, we glorify God. When it comes to Christmas, Christians should be the most exuberant and the most generous they can be. The fact that we are part of a culture that still celebrates Christmas with cookies and trees and lights and gifts and feasting should not be a problem for us at all. Despite the fact that some people don't know the reason for the season, or despite the fact that some people misuse all the gifts, shouldn't slow us down in the slightest. God created this world, he filled it with good things, and he created us in his image with physical material bodies made to enjoy his good gifts. And even when we sinned, God didn't stop giving. In fact, the ultimate gift was the incarnation, God becoming flesh, God becoming material. And just so we don't miss the point, God gave us this meal where we celebrate his presence with us through sharing these gifts of bread and wine. 
The goal is not to stare at the gifts as though the gifts appeared out of nowhere or had some kind of power in themselves. The goal is to give thanks and enjoy these gifts, and in so doing, enjoy the giver of these gifts. But if that is what God is teaching us here, part of the way that we demonstrate that we have understood it is in our gratitude and generosity everywhere else. So we want our celebrations to match God's goodness. We want our feasting and singing and generosity to match, as best as we can, God's great grace. And the central way we do that is by receiving his gifts with great joy. So come and welcome to Jesus Christ. As you go today, as you go with his blessing, remember that all of this, the lights, the feasting, the gifts, all of it, is because Christ came and he made the world new. He judged the prince of this world, he cast him down, and he has no longer any power over you. The blood of Christ is what we have to overcome the devil and all his works. So confess your sins, forgive quickly, have the blood over your door, and so walk in newness of life. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. And amen.